Hi, and thank you for joining me for another video. Today, friends, at the audience's request, I'm going to be explaining some of the ideas from my previous video titled, A Jew Disproves Dr. Michael Brown's Teachings, while at the same time responding to another response submitted by Cobain the Christian. I'm going to start off by explaining the lineage of Solomon. So, the speaker claimed that the Messiah did not necessarily have to come from the line of Solomon because, according to the teachings of Michael Brown, Solomon did not live up to his end of the deal. Is this true? Well, let's hop into scripture and investigate. Look, I'm going to present you every passage of scripture that refers to this case in order that you could understand really what's going on here. First, one must understand that the promise of eternality wasn't made to Solomon, but to King David. So whenever it refers to the eternal throne, no matter who's ruling on it at the time, it's ultimately considered the throne of David because the promise was made to him. Now, there's really something that I first have to establish in the mind of every Christian before they could begin to understand what the Bible is saying here. And that is that if you don't take God at his word, you might as well throw your Bible away, my friends. Why? Because then it's meaningless. It means nothing. Now, I know that Christianity has then had the best track record in taking the words of God at face value. Well, with their opinion that God broke his eternal covenant with the Jews, God abolishing his eternal law, God changing his mind about his oneness, God becoming a man, and God blatantly lying to all of us when he uses the word forever in scripture, right? Friends, please consider what I just said very carefully. The Bible loses any power of credibility when we cannot take God at his word. So, Keep this in mind as we review these passages. Now, the key words you need to focus on are kingdom or a throne that's forever. Again, a kingdom or a throne that's forever. Not just a throne, a throne that's forever. As it states in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 13, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Leolam forever. Friends, like I said in my previous video, clearly a distinction between the temporal kingdom of Solomon here in verse 12 and the eternal throne that was promised to David in verse 13. That would live on through him. Still with me? So in other words, the kingdom was conditional and the throne was an eternal promise that was given to David. Eternal only when it said eternal. Eternal when it says forever, obviously, as we can see living on through Solomon. But if you would try to understand it from the perspective of the Christian critic, you would have to think that God is lying by stating that his throne is forever, even though we just read it. So either God is being terribly redundant by telling us that the kingdom and the eternal throne are the same when one has a promise clearly attached to it and the other doesn't, or he is making a distinction between the conditional and the eternal, thus setting the stage for his promise to be kept. Okay, reading on 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 10 through 14. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are over and you go to be with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take my love away from him as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Again, friends, did you notice the difference between the temporal kingdom and the throne that will be established forever? It's amazing when you take God at his word, no? And here the Almighty states that the eternal throne is his kingdom. Amazing, huh? And if you notice here, he is limiting the promise to one of David's sons, not grandsons. Well, anyways, reading on. David is speaking now. And now, Lord, let the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house be established forever. Do as you promised, so that it will be established that your name will be great forever. Then men will say, the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. And again, here David is blatantly stating that this is what the Lord stated, or like it says, that it promised in the text. And what was that promise? Well, that according to David, that the house of your servant will be established before you. Referring to his line, something that can't be stripped away. His legacy, his messianic line. Also, 
Did you just notice that King David equated the throne being established forever to God's name being great forever? Perhaps the speaker thinks that this is also finite and conditional. Well, anyways, reading on. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 7 through 13. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, but the word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on earth in my sight, but you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be peace, for I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now my son, the Lord be with you and may you have success and build the house of the Lord your God as he said you would. May the Lord give you discretion and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and laws that the Lord God gave to Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. So, here King David makes that distinction again, when in verse 10 he stated, And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Not just throne alone, it has to be throne forever. That's the line we're talking about, because throne could also be referring to the temporal throne. But in verse 13, he states that he will only have success if he stays on the paths of the Lord, clearly making a huge distinction between success in his kingdom and his throne being established forever. Now, friends, we have to understand that the Bible doesn't contradict itself. When the Lord says forever, he means forever. That's why I read the passages in order so you can understand God's words in context. So far, Solomon has just been made king of Israel. First Chronicles 28, verse 6 to 7. He said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever if he is unswerving and carrying out my commands and laws as being done at this time. Again, my friends, here it doesn't mention throne. Clearly a conditional promise referring to his current kingdom, stating that if he does not sway to the left or the right, his kingdom could last forever. Clear enough? Reading on, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 17 through 20. As for you, if you live in my presence, as did your father David, doing everything I have ordered you to do, and keeping my laws and rulings... Then I will establish the throne of your kingship. Notice it didn't say forever, clearly referring to his current kingdom. As I have covenanted with David your father when I said to him, You will never lack a man to be ruler in Israel. But if you turn away and abandon my regulations and mitzvahs, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods, worshipping them, then I will pull them up from the roots of the land I have given them. This house which I consecrated for my name I will eject from my sight, and I will make it an example to avoid and an object of scorn among all people peoples. So here we see that this is still referring to his temporal rule because as people who take God at his word, he didn't say forever. Remember, the promise that God made to King David was referring to the throne that will exist forever. Just like it says in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10, that the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his legs. That, my friends, is the promise that we're understanding through Solomon in these passages. Why? Because just like it says in Torah that God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. So in other words, friends, if God doesn't say that something's eternal, you have no right to think it is. But when God uses the words, an eternal throne or a throne that will be established forever, we have no choice but to take him at his word. Now, we see that although King Solomon started off in the paths of God, he eventually lost his way. And we see that the conditional promise was put into effect. It states in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 11. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hands of your son. Clear enough, friends? Now, another great example that solidifies the point of the eternal throne and the current Judaic kingdom is Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 28 through 30. Thus says the Lord, write 
this man down is childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling in Judah anymore. Now, did you notice the distinction? Here is referring to the end of Jeconiah's kingdom, which he ruled from the eternal throne of David that was established through Solomon. And I don't have to remind you that King David and Solomon were long gone when this prophecy came into existence. And again, it was referring to their eternal throne. So friends, to quote one of their works, let God be true and every man a liar. Friends, God did not lie to us. And you know what, friends? Israel and its kings did fall away, which is why we saw above that although the position for the throne is still available, we don't have a king to sit upon it. So there is no way that the eternal throne could be conditional because then there could be no Messiah descending from King David. So in other words, it was through King Solomon that the throne of David was established. So every other descendant on the throne would only be eligible to rule if he was descended from Solomon. Makes sense, huh? Then out of respect for King Solomon, I then stated that the book of Ecclesiastes tells us what happened towards the end of King Solomon's life. But my Christian critic claims that because we don't know exactly when the book was written, it proves nothing. Even when every major theologian will tell you that according to the narrative, it was clearly written later in his life. So the chances of King Solomon dying a pagan is very, very slim, my friends. Then my Christian critic claims that God lied again, or like he states, changed his mind, going against his own words in Jeremiah when he said, For none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling in Judah anymore, when referring to Jeconiah, because he allowed his son Zerubbabel to later rule in Judah. I wish I could blame this on some Hebrew to English translation error, but friends, I can't. The reader's just skipping the fact that it says that he was made governor of Judea, not king, and by a foreign pagan king, might I add. It's a big difference. Or would he also claim that Pontius Pilate, who was also a governor of Judea, was also king of Israel, sitting on David's throne. So please stop quoting books and think for yourself. Now, I'm not saying that later in Jeconiah's life, God didn't forgive Jeconiah for his sins. He may have if Jeconiah repented. That's fine, but that doesn't in any way mean that God went back on the punishment. No, friends, what I'm saying is that God did not lie. It was actually 100% historically accurate when it states, For none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling in Judah anymore, because none of them ever did. So stop making the Almighty into a liar. Chas v'shalom. And the speaker here again fails to mention how this argument justifies Matthew using this corrupted line if it wasn't even kosher. And then the speaker claims that the true line is a line found in the book of Luke, which he claims again belongs to Mary. And again, with no biblical proof, unless you consider apocryphal writings written almost 200 years after Jesus as proof. But honestly, isn't it all just apocryphal writings and church tradition for him anyways? Because how can we really prove who wrote the New Testament books or who wrote the book of Hebrews or, or who wrote the book of Matthew or Luke or any of the Gospels or the book of Revelations? Huh? Which John was it? Oh, you know, when all historians say they don't? Eastern Orthodox Church tradition, huh? A nice solid platform to stand on. But if the speaker would have done his research a bit more clearly, he would have seen that in Luke's butcher genealogy, he has included the descendants of Jeconiah, Sheotio, and Zerubbabel, which in turn also invalidates this line, the line he considers to be the line of Mary. Again, even though it doesn't appear anywhere in the New Testament. And we could see that even the early Christians, who were more knowledgeable in Scripture than Christians today, didn't even try to justify Jesus' corrupt genealogy because of all the problems, as Paul states, that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables or endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. So friends, what's the outcome? You guessed it. Both of Joseph's lines do not qualify. Then the Christian critic claims that the Jewish people sacrificed for the sins of all the nations. Now, I'm not sure where this ever appeared in Torah, so please give sources. And the idea of being a priestly nation never meant that we intercede via sacrifices, but only through the godliness and holiness that a priest is supposed to live by. So again, please post sources for this. Then the speaker claims that God only forgives Israel without sacrifices in the exile when the temple is standing. 
and in some way uses Daniel to back this up. But what he didn't even mention is that Daniel also prayed toward Jerusalem three times a day when there was no temple in the manner that was prescribed by King Solomon in Kings. As it states in Daniel 6.10, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. So, silly kid, check me. He then claims that sins could not be forgiven without sacrifices. And to back this up, he reads the Yom Kippur service in the temple. Now friends, again, we have another disconnect. First of all, Yom Kippur never atoned for personal sin. Yom Kippur was only a national atonement. Also, if you read it carefully, sir, you would have noticed that this is a sin offering that is sacrificed for the people of Israel. A sin offering, a korban chatas, a sacrifice that is brought only for unintentional sins. And again, for intentional sins, only repentance would suffice. And stating that because Aaron confessed all the sins of the Jewish people shows that it was for intentional sins is also a bit funny. I mean, can you really imagine how long it would take for him to confess all the sins of the Jewish people they committed that year, even by some miracle? miracle he knew them all? No friends, this was a confession of the nation's sin, but not in the manner that he explained, not forgiving us for what we did as a nation, but rather for forgiving us for what we didn't do. And if you didn't notice, nowhere in the passage does it state that this goat was sacrificed, but rather it states that it was made to wander off. So again, how does this compare to Jesus dying on a cross again? And if this is the only example you could find, just shows me how desperate you were for sources. And then he claims that in the New Testament, Jesus is compared to the scapegoat. I hope that he knows that a goat and a lamb are not in the same family. But really, you could compare Jesus to any animal you want. But know that by doing so, won't make your case any more valid. Oh, and I'm sure you know that because you said that you understand Judaism, that even the Paschal Lamb wasn't a sacrifice for sin. And even if it was, which it wasn't, how could a Gentile benefit from a biblical sacrifice done in his behalf anyways? Because he even acknowledged that the law doesn't apply to non-Jews. And the speaker said that I said my reference in Hosea is referring to Babylon, which I never stated. I stated the Paschal is referring to our current exile, referring to how God will accept for sacrifices the prayers of our lips. And then he said that Hosea could be translated many different ways. Well, the truth is that it cannot be translated many different ways, but that it has been intentionally mistranslated by the New Testament book of Hebrews to prove the Christian point. And I'm not just going to throw blind facts at you, I'm going to prove it in a way that you don't even have to know Hebrew to understand. Compare. And you call this divinely inspired? And then my Christian critic claimed that the prophet mentioned in Deuteronomy 18 is clearly, clearly referring to Jesus. Now friends, one thing we have to keep in mind when reading the Bible is in what context are prophecies or laws given. Because to think that when God said to the Israelites that he would raise up a prophet like Moses, that he was referring to Jesus of Nazareth, and they would have known this instead of assuming it was Moses' successor, Joshua, is really stretching it. Why? Because it states, The Lord said to me, What they said is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. And after this, we see, as it states in Joshua 3, 9, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. His words. And if Jesus was not just a man, but God himself, shouldn't the prophecy not make the distinction between God's words and the prophet's words? if he is God himself, when it even states in Joshua 1.5, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. It was clearly talking about Joshua, just like I said in Joshua 3.7, And God said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify you in the sight of all of Israel. They may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. So clearly, Joshua was a more likely candidate than Jesus of Nazareth. Not to mention that the Torah is clear that if the supposed prophet's predictions do not come true, he is a false prophet. Like Jesus said in Luke 9.27, But I tell you the truth, there are some standing here which shall not taste death, 
till they see the kingdom of God. Clearly a false prediction, or in Matthew 24, 34, when Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And don't forget what the verse stated, that this prophet will be like Moses. So, a little common sense is in order here. Throughout all of Jewish history, is every Christian ready to say that Jesus was the closest prophet we had to Moses? Right? I mean, not the prophets who physically led the Jewish people, who got them to abandon idolatry and return to the Lord. Friends, this was the mission of almost every prophet in the Hebrew Scriptures. And yet, Jesus in some way in his three-year ministry equals up? And we even see that Muslims claim that this is referring to Muhammad and the Mormons claim that this is referring to Joseph Smith. So the Christians are new here. But I would say that the most convincing verse on how Jesus is, is not the prophet in Deuteronomy 18 is Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 through 4. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears to you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey him, serve him, and hold fast to him. Yes, friends, and if you notice, at the end, it tells us to keep God's commandments and obey only him. And being that Jesus did away with the commandments, I think this answers your question. But then the speaker will say, oh, well, that Jesus didn't abolish the law, he fulfilled them. Look, what's the difference? Are they being kept by believers anymore? No, so they're abolished. And especially when the Lord said that these laws were forever, but again, we know that Forever is not a word that Christians like very much. Then my Christian critic claims that there was no historical evidence that ever refers to a virgin birth prior to the rise of Christianity. Really, my friend? So what's this? The ants go marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. The ants go marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. The ants go marching one by one, the little one stops to suck his thumb. And has a speaker ever asked himself, what is Isaiah 714 really saying and in what context is it really speaking? Well, friends, if you're a Christian, this may be a bit shocking to hear, but the Bible, my friends, does not revolve around the idea of a Messiah, either Jewish or Christian. No, friends, the Bible is a guidebook created only for us to know how God acts in history. So what? So that we can learn to emulate him. So if you study scripture like this, then you can actually learn how to behave and live life properly instead of looking for a heavenly bailout on every page. Because this is not how the righteous behave. No, friends, people who study scripture in such a manner don't want godly ethics. What they want, my friends, is a lottery ticket. And sir, you are free to believe whatever you want, but I'll be damned if I stay here and let you mislead others. Because Isaiah 7.14 is not referring to Jesus, and I'm going to do something that you probably never heard heard of, I'm going to read the passage in context. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched on Jerusalem to wage war against it. And he could not wage war against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, and his heart and the heart of his people trembled as the trees of the forest tremble because of the wind. Friends, if you understood what I just read carefully, you would know that Judah was on the verge of destruction. Syria and Ephraim had joined forces to wage war. And those who trusted on the Lord were about to be conquered. And you know why? Because of their sin. And unlike Israel today, they knew it. But there's more. And the Lord said to Isaiah, 
Now go out toward Ahaz, you and Sharyashev, your son, to the edge of the conduit of the upper pool, to the road of the washer's field, and you shall say to him, Feel secure and calm yourself. Do not fear and let your heart not be faint because of these two smoking stubs of firebrand. Because of the raging anger of Rezim and Aram and the son of Remilia. Since Aram planned harm to you, Ephraim and the son of Remilia, saying, Let us go up against Judah and provoke it, and annex it to us, and let us crown a king in its midst, one who is good for us. So said the Lord God, Neither shall it succeed, nor shall it come to pass. And the Lord continued to speak to Ahaz, saying, Ask for yourself a sign from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depths or in the heights above. And Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. And he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it little for you to weary men, that you weary my God as well? Therefore the Lord of his own shall give you a sign. Behold, the young woman is with child, and she shall bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Cream and honey he shall eat when he knows to reject bad and choose good. For when the lad does not yet know to reject bad and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread shall be abandoned. Do you see it? Do you see what happened, friends? The Lord is getting involved. In verse 3 it stated that God told Isaiah to go to King Ahaz, you and your son Shariashev, right? You first have to ask, friends, why did God ask him to take his son with him? Now, only having the English in front of you will confuse you a bit, but in Hebrew you'll see the answer, my friends. The reason he wanted Isaiah and his son to go to the king was because in Hebrew, Shar Yashav means a remnant will repent, they will return to the Lord. And Isaiah means God is here to help. And this is exactly what it shows in chapter 10, verse 21, right? It states, a remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob will return to the Almighty. Though your people, O Israel, be like the sand by the sea, only a remnant will return. It specifically says, it uses the word Shar Yashav. But that's not it. It says, friends, I'll give you another sign. Behold, the young woman is with child, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. What he meant by this was that when the child is born, you will know that God is on your side. When he first was on the other side because of our sin. But now, my friends, God is with us. We see that. This prophecy was fulfilled in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 7 through 8, referring to the same event. It says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence for what Hezekiah the king of Judah said. This, my friends, is clearly a sign of our Lord's great mercy and kindness to those who trust in him. And I will not sit by while the church tries to pervert it by trying to make it justify some pagan virgin birth. And pagan, like I just proved, it is. And it's clearly a perversion to the point that we even see that they try to reword it to justify the cause of Jesus, right? Jesus who actually came 700 years down the road. Here you see that Christian Bibles actually put the verse in the future tense trying to justify their cause, stating that a woman will be with child. Not how it's clearly written in the Hebrew in the present tense, that a young woman is with child. And they even change it to say that they will call his name Emmanuel instead of saying what it says in scripture that she will call his name Emmanuel. And we even see that Joseph doesn't even call him Emmanuel, but Jesus. And have you ever even stopped and really thought about it and understood how despicable the Christian claims are, right? That God would have sexual relationships with a betrothed woman right? Thereby causing her to violate one of God's commandments, one of his own commandments for which she would be liable to receive the death penalty for. And if this is really a prophecy referring to Jesus, what happened to the rest of the prophecy? Or do Christians just toss that out also? How about her calling his name Emmanuel? Because we know it was Joseph who named him Jesus and not Emmanuel. And it says, curds and honey he shall eat. When did the New Testament state that Jesus ate curds and honey? It says that when he knows to refuse evil and choose good. Now, could Jesus, if he was sinless, choose evil as opposed to good? And then it says, the two kings you have a horror from will be forsaken. Where in the New Testament do we find these two kings? Huh? Divinely inspired, huh? Then the speaker claims that he understands Judaism and I don't understand Christianity. <laughs> 
first of all, anyone who has followed my work knows that I'm very well versed in Christianity, but he must remember that it is Christianity that is the offshoot of Judaism, not the other way around. In other words, it is Judaism that must validate Christianity. And again, not the other way around. So quoting New Testament scripture doesn't justify your cause in any way. And then he stated that I have a wrong understanding of the Trinity. Well, in my previous video, I stated that the Trinity was three independent beings or gods making up one God. Honestly, was I off? Because even Webster defines it as the union of three persons in one Godhead or the threefold personality of one divine being. Now, is there really a difference, my friends? No, the problem is that Christians view the Old Testament with New Testament glasses instead of the other way around. Friends, it's time to wake up and put newer, flimsier belief systems behind and embrace Torah Judaism. Today, my friends, could be the beginning of an awesome journey. You can choose Torah, you can choose Judaism. If you want to learn more about Torah Judaism, please visit BeJewish.org. And to convert to Judaism, please visit Torah Judaism International. Thank you.